And as we prepare to hear our message today, let us now pray to prepare our hearts. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And I'd invite you, if you have your Bibles with you, to take them out so that you can follow along with our passage today from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. I suspect upon hearing this passage that our minds often focus on the great challenges that the Apostle Paul endured. The Apostle Paul was God's servant. He endured troubles and hardships and distresses, beatings and imprisonment and riots. After his conversion, Paul was a very dedicated servant to God. God had taken hold of him, turned him around after his persecution of early Christians, and used him to further the gospel message to Jews, and particularly to Gentiles. His story is one taught regularly in, in the church and a significant example of God's grace, that the persecutor, the one who was persecuting in the early church, could become a significant leader in that same church. You and I, however, are also called to be co-workers or servants of God. I've been here in Manama for roughly a month, and I've heard a few of you share stories of hardships and troubles that you have endured for the gospel, as well as stories of others in your lives and in your home countries where they have experienced similar things. Challenges continue in our world for God's servants. John Wesley was one such servant. Wesley lived in the 1700s, born in 1703 and going to be with our Lord in 1791. He was a reformer in the Church of England and is known as the father of the Methodist and Wesleyan churches. Through, though his intention was to remain in the Church of England, an impact on the church in England, in the United States, and other parts of the world. As with many reformers, though, his life was not easy. One person writes of his life, John Wesley was riding along a road one day when he realized that three whole days had passed in which he had suffered no persecution. Three whole days without persecution. Not a brick or an egg had been thrown at him for three whole days. Alarmed, he stopped his horse and exclaimed, Can it be that I have sinned? He feared he had fallen out of God's grace. Dismounting from his horse, Wesley went down on his knees and began interceding with God to show him where, if any, there had been a fault. A man on the other side of the fence, hearing his prayer, looked across and recognized the preacher. I'll fix that Methodist preacher, he said, picking up a brick and tossing it over at him. It missed its mark and fell harmlessly beside Wesley. Wesley then leaped to his feet joyfully exclaiming, thank you, God, it's all right. I still have God's presence. Before I continue, please note this is not a fear that I share with Wesley. No bricks or eggs are needed in this sanctuary today. Perhaps all of us should be careful what we pray in public. There is a danger that we focus only on the hardships we endure for the gospel as co-workers or servants of God. God also offers us blessing, and we should not go out seeking hardships. Paul endured these hardships as a consequence of the work he was doing for our Lord and not as a goal. Our passage today begins as God's co-workers. This word, co-workers, is translated from the Greek, synerguntis, and is a verb used as a noun. The Greek means to be helpful in every respect, to work together with, to assist, or to help. 
This describes an aspect of our relationship with God. Our calls are to be co-workers, or perhaps, more, or more accurately, servants or helpers of God. This is not, though, because God needs our help or needs us as servants, but because he invites us into service with him, we have the privilege of being God's servants or co-workers, and we do this work out of gratitude for what God has already done for us. In the creation of the world, his abundance care or blessing of us, and his atoning sacrifice of Jesus the Messiah on the cross. God is already at work reconciling the, word, the world to himself. Our job is to look for where he is already working and to join alongside him. To understand how Paul is addressing the Corinthians, it's important to understand the context of this letter. The church in Corinth is suffering due to conflict over who they should look for leadership. Paul had originally planted his church. However, there are some so-called super apostles who are undermining Paul's work and questioning his authority. Some are even claiming that his rings are a reason that he is not a true apostle as they claim they are. They believe he is suffering too much. He couldn't possibly be called by God and experiencing God's favor if he's enduring such hardship. Paul obviously disagrees and challenges them that his sufferings demonstrate his reliance on Jesus. Only through Jesus could he endure and overcome these hardships, believes Paul. In this particular passage, he certainly does not cover up his sufferings to appease these super apostles. He shares freely what he has endured. The church in Corinth had also struggled with church unity and the immorality that was common in the city of Corinth. After outright rebellion to the church, to Paul, many had repented. However, several people had continued to challenge Paul's authority. Again, begins this section. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. Paul fears that the Corinthians' disunity and disrespect of the gospel he has shared suggests some have not truly received the gospel message, but have received it in a useless manner. It seems to have no real effect on them. They have not been inwardly changed. Have they really heard and accepted the gospel? We should also be similarly careful that we have not received the gospel in vain. In our world today, it is very easy to substitute another message for Christ's message. We might allow the distractions of the world to take us away from the call of God has placed on our lives. As we heard in the retreat this past weekend, we might allow WhatsApp, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, television shows or movies or other distractions to occupy an unreasonable amount of our time. Alternatively, we might allow peripheral issues to overcome what is essential as co-workers or servants of God. A number of churches in my country in the United States are focused on the mundane, what doesn't have consequences in the kingdom of God. They are focused on themselves and not the world outside their doors. They argue over the color of the carpet or arranging the furniture in the sanctuary rather than seeking the lost in the neighborhoods they find themselves in. In any case, it is essential for God's servants to be changed by the gospel, to be uprooted and to move their membership from that of this world or the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. Such a change in membership is life-changing as it was for Paul and comes with great risk. But the reward is great through the gift of reconciliation with the living God and through eternal life in his presence. 
Paul further defends himself in saying that they put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that their ministry will not be discredited. If we should appear to those who have not yet accepted the gospel in a way that discredits our ministry, how can we expect that they will accept the message we offer them? If we appear combative, angry, or unloving, they're likely to see the message we bring as servants as similarly combative, angry, and unloving. Where is the good news in that? We must put the interest of others inside and outside the church above those of our own. If we don't, our ministry is likely to be similarly discredited. Paul then begins to enumerate his hardships and trials. This is not to build himself up, but to defend himself against the super apostles in the church of the Corinthians. First, in great endurance, he identifies nine hardships he has faced. His general tribulations include troubles, hardships, and distresses. The NIV, the translation that we've heard, tends to soften these words a bit. The ESV translates the same words as afflictions, hardships, and calamities. As servants, we will likely or have likely endured these challenges at one point. The choice to be a co-worker of God is not one of guaranteed comfort. It's not one of guaranteed wealth or health, despite that some pastors might present such a message. Pastors who preach this health and wellness or prosperity gospel are misleading people today as the super apostles were in the church in Corinth in Paul's day. Such a message suggests we can manipulate God into giving us what we want and dismisses or destroys our acknowledgement of God's true sovereignty. Paul continues to identify his sufferings at the hands of others, beatings, imprisonments, and riots. Remember that Paul endured 39 lashes on five occasions and beatings with rods three times. He had been imprisoned and challenged by riots. Paul had also voluntarily suffered. He had worked hard, had sleepless nights, and gone hungry. Among other efforts, Paul chose to earn his own living as a tent maker and had chosen to travel significantly for his ministry. All of this likely resulted in these hardships. His choice to be a co-worker or servant and his commitment to the task caused him hardship. One commentator also notes that Paul had been given eight graces associated with the Holy Spirit. Our passage continues to identify these as purity, understanding, patience, and kindness. They were given him in the Holy Spirit, in sincere love, in truthful speech, and in the power of God. The Holy Spirit had moved and gifted Paul in very significant ways. Paul was further supported through many different circumstances. First was his possession of the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. He was thoroughly equipped by God for the work he was doing. Second, he was supported in glory and in dishonor. When people respected him and when they did not. Finally, he was supported in both bad report and good report. The words of those he encountered, whether good or bad, did not cause him to depart from the mission he was completing as a servant to God. They also didn't significantly hinder his work, demonstrating he had God's support through these tribulations. While considering the challenges of those around him, he didn't allow their false reports to destroy his mission. 
Paul realized, though, that God's economy is different than the world's economy. What the world values and how the world reacts is different than what God values and what God reacts. Paul's actions are viewed differently in the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of darkness. He was genuine, but the world saw him as an imposter. He was known, but the world saw him as unknown. He was living on through God's support and promise of eternal life, but the world saw him as dying. He had many reasons to be sorrowful, but God gave him the ability to rejoice. In worldly terms, he was poor, but God had given him a great spiritual richness, and he had been given the ability to give this richness to others. Finally, in worldly terms, he had nothing, but yet he possessed everything, as God had given him salvation through Jesus Christ and eternal life. That was sufficient for Paul. Paul had allowed himself to be radically changed by the gospel from one who was persecuting Christians shortly before to one who was taking Christ's message, the message his former enemies possessed out into the world. He saw the world through different eyes. What the world valued was of little concern to him where it didn't prevent his message from taking hold. He focused himself intently upon what God valued. Those who knew him before must have wondered whether they recognized the Saul they once knew, for he was a different person in God's economy. This transformational message is part of what Paul is trying to get across to the Corinthians. They, too, should be transformed. They, too, should appear completely different from once they, how they once appeared. They should find themselves in a new economy, valuing things very differently from how they valued them before. Further, he intended to make them wonder whether any of this would be possible but by the grace of God. His argument is that he has endured all this and survived all, all this through God's grace and through his reliance on Christ. He is the true apostle, and the so-called super apostles are misleading them. Paul has great affection, great love for the Corinthians, despite the many trials he has experienced due to their disunity and disrespect, and finds their withholding the same from him. They haven't been offering him their affection, he appeals to them that they open wide their hearts, that they would hear his message and show affection towards him. I began my message by noting that our minds often focus in this passage on the great hardships that Paul endured. The world might have us focus on gaining our own comfort and safety, though being servants or co-workers of God often denies us this. There are some who endure great hardships for the gospel, quite a number in places far from where we worship on this day. As I mentioned before, I invite your prayers for them. Their hardship is very significant. Further, we live in a time where the church that we can see is much larger than in the time of Paul. In this period of the early church, Paul was regularly doing this work alone or in very small groups. We have the church to send this day, and it is both the responsibility of the church and of each of us as servants to support those who are enduring hardship. Such suffering should not be alone where the church is well established. We live in a world today that may look very different from the world that Paul lived in. However, we experience many of the same challenges he experienced with the Corinthians. As Paul did with the Corinthians, I invite you to look into your lives to determine where you place distractions and leaders, whether figuratively or literally, 
in the way of the gospel and its transforming influence on your lives? Who do you allow to lead your life in direct and in subtle ways? The Corinthians were being misled by others in the world in a time when communication was limited to direct contact and through letters. Today, we live in a world where most of us have pockets that carry messages of many different leaders available in an instant. Some of these are faithful leaders and will direct us in the right way. Others are leaders of other sorts. We also might be one of the leaders who distracts regularly or occasionally. How are we contributing to the spiritual development of those around us? And how are we distracting them from the message God offers them? Paul notes that he has put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that their ministry will not be discredited. I'm new here. Most of you know this congregation better than I do. How are we doing as a congregation at demonstrating the fruits of the Spirit? Paul shares these in Galatians chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Would someone who had not heard the gospel recognize these within us consistently? When or where would he or she wonder and recognize stumbling blocks? Which is the economy in which we interpret our experiences? Do we work to store up treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal? Or do we store up for ourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal? Our heart, like Paul's, will follow where we place our treasure. As Paul states, I urge you not to receive the, God's grace in vain. Be transformed as Paul was transformed into God's economy. Let yourself be made into something radically new, even that others from your life before might not even recognize. Put aside the ways of the world where we follow leaders who tell us something we desire to hear about earthly comforts and earthly status. Become co-workers or servants of God, putting no stumbling block in the paths of others. We have a God who has offered us reconciliation and forgiveness. We have a God who has offered us eternal life. In gratitude, let us now go out into the world as God's servants, as God's co-workers offering no stumbling block to those we encounter. Let us look to where God is already working and join him to bring the kingdom of God to earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.